Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Strength to Strength. It's a pleasure to see all your faces on here with us this morning. Uh, get up early on a Saturday morning to hear about the sacred writings, the texts that we have. This morning, we have Brother Chuck joining us here from um, from Boston. Which town is it again? Winchester. Manchester. Okay. Win Win Winchester with the W. So. Winchester. There we are. All right. Um, he's joining us this morning to share on the Bible that Jesus read. Uh, before we get started here, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we're so grateful that you have preserved a word, your truth, to cleanse us and to guide us into truth. We thank you that Brother Chuck is here this morning to share what he's learned through study about the Bible and about the word that we read. I just pray that you would bless him as he shares. May his thoughts run smoothly and his words um, may he speak clearly about the things that he's discovered, and I just pray that we would be blessed by what he has to share and how you have preserved your truth from the time when, um, from creation until now, so that we can see your hand at work on your people. Just bless this time this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Go ahead, Amen. Brother Chuck. It's great to be here. Hello to everyone who's listening in. I'm very excited about what we're going to talk about today. This is, I have a great passion for the Old Testament. I've been studying and teaching the Old Testament for about 40 years. I decided as a young man in my 20s that, uh, that the Old Testament had a big impact on my life, and I want to be able to share that with Christians. So uh, uh, that, that's, that's a subject I care very deeply about. I live in the Boston area, lead a house church here but co-lead with, uh, with David Adams. And uh, so it's, it's a real blessing to be able to share the word of God and talk about the word of God with everyone. Okay, so the, the topic that we are looking at today is the Bible Jesus read, why consider the Septuagint? And a little overview of the class. First of all, I want to talk about what is the Septuagint, abbreviated LXX? You may have seen that before in the notes in your Bibles. A uh, little discussion around the origins of the Septuagint and ask ourselves the question, what version of the Old Testament was Jesus reading? What can we learn about that? What was the Bible used by the apostles and the early disciples? And then some practical benefits of using the, the Septuagint in your own study and then some resources and then open it up for robust questions and discussion. Okay, first question, how did I get here? Well, I, I mentioned I love the Old Testament. I've been teaching it for about 40 years. And about 25 years ago, I started considering the perspective of the early Christians. I noticed that they talked quite a bit about the Septuagint, but I only started digging into it myself about 10 years ago. So of the 40 years I've been teaching the Bible, it's really just the past 10 or so that I have been looking at the Septuagint text for that. So, uh, um, and actually I uh, had an opportunity, I'm, I'm, I'm terrible language, but I had an opportunity to uh, learn Greek, taking a class from Penny Corvilla, who's gonna be teaching a lesson in this series on the original Bible languages. And I really wanted to be able to learn Greek to be able to compare the Septuagint with the New Testament among other things. So my focus in teaching the Old Testament is how do we live the Christian life? What is it going to take to make it to the end? And how can, how can we use the lessons from the Old Testament to really get there, to strengthen the Christians? Also focus on connections between the New Testament and the Old Testament. And then lately, the last, last uh, 10 years, 15 years or so, focusing rather heavily on how the world was evangelized in the beginning by the apostles using the Old Testament prophecies to convince unbelievers and to spread the faith. So it's very practical focus, not an academic focus in studying the Old Testament. But uh, so to prepare for this lesson, 
And to answer some of the questions that people would naturally have, I had to dig into a little bit more of the history and, and the background and discussions about the Septuagint versus the Masoretic text. A little bit of, of overview, almost all modern Bibles, and I'm even including the King James there, have the Old Testament based on the Masoretic text. It's a, a, a Hebrew language text. There are some, some, some sections in it that are Aramaic uh, as well, but it's, it's primarily Hebrew text. And uh, the, the oldest manuscripts of the Masoretic text go back to about 1000 AD. The, the Codex Leningrad is around 1009, and the, the, which is a complete text, and the Codex Aleppo is around 930. AD. So these are texts that are about a thousand years old. Uh, on the other hand, the Septuagint is a Greek translation of the Old Testament scriptures made by the Jews during the period, during the, the third century and, and second century BC predominantly. And uh, the, the earliest manuscripts that we have of the Septuagint are go back to the year uh, 325, 350 AD. And the Septuagint is particularly interesting to me because it's quoted extensively by New Testament writers. When you take the New Testament quotes and go back and compare whether they're taking it from the Septuagint or the Masoretic text, they're usually taking it from the Septuagint. The, it's also interesting to me because it's the Bible of the early church. When I started reading the early Christians, it's quite obvious this is the Bible that they're using for their Old Testament. And this was the Bible of the church for the first three, four hundred years. And people ask the question, well, if it was the Bible of the Old Testament text for the church in the beginning, why aren't we still using it? Well, actually, some people still are. The Eastern churches, and by that I mean the Orthodox churches, the Coptic churches, never gave up the Septuagint. They've been using it from the beginning. It's the Western churches that after the year about 400, moved more to a to a Hebrew text for the for the Old Testament. So in the Eastern churches here, um, the Orthodox Coptic Christians, you're talking roughly 250, 300 million people in those churches who still use the Septuagint. About 10% of the worldwide Christian faith is made of people who are in churches that, that still use this, this, the Septuagint text. Uh, give you a little bit of a uh, little timeline here I thought would be helpful. So as I mentioned, the, the Septuagint is translated 280, starting around 280 BC to, uh, you know, third century, second century, before the time of Christ. <clears throat> so it was a Jewish translation, not a Christian translation. And um, the Masoretic text, as I mentioned, goes back to about a thousand AD, so it's man, manus, Masoretic text manuscripts are roughly a thousand years old. I had uh, my Jewish next door neighbor was all over my house for coffee and tea and a little discussion a few weeks ago, and we got into a discussion about the Old Testament. And I said, "Well, I'm I'm learning Greek so that I can read the Old Testament and the Septuagint." And he looked at me with a quizzical look and says, "Well, why in the world would you learn Greek?" because the scriptures are in Hebrew. And I said, well, <laughs> the scriptures that you're reading, the texts that you're reading from are about a thousand years old. The manuscripts are about, a, go back to about a thousand years ago. However, the Septuagint manuscripts that I'm reading from go back another 600 years. So it's 600 years earlier. In, in, in history, the manuscripts go back further. And of course, as I mentioned, the translation goes back uh, much earlier to third century BC. So just a little timeline to give you an idea why this is important. <laughs> the, the significance of the Greek language in the evangelization of the world, the story starts really with Alexander the Great from Macedonia, northern, north of Greece, who, of course, he's a Greek speaker, and he conquers from Macedonia through Asia Minor, then down conquers Egypt, and then defeats the entire Persian Empire. And his Alexander's empire extends all the way into modern Pakistan, Afghanistan, the western side of India. So it's a vast amount of territory that was influenced by 
Alexander's conquest. That's around 330 BC. Alexander, the, the conquests of Alexander are prophesied in the book of Daniel about the Greek kingdom that would come. There are a few, few mentions of that in there. Um, and the story of the translation of the Septuagint, and this question is, is it historical fact or is it legend? We're gonna explore that a little bit, but I think this is important to understand. You really have to start with, with a work called the Letter of Aristius. And so this was a few decades after the establishment of Alexandria and Ptolemy II Philadelphus, according to the text, the, the king wants to establish a great library in Alexandria. This would become the most famous library in the ancient world. And according to the letter of Aristius, who works in his court, uh, he asks to have the Jewish high priest Eliezer send down translators to translate the law of Moses, the five books, into Greek so they can be part of this great library. And as I mentioned, the translation is about the, the third century BC. So this is all recorded in the letter of Aristius. And there's uh, it, where Alexandria is. Alexandria was founded by Alexander and it was named after him shortly, uh, you know, within a few years after its, its founding. So Alexandria is on the Mediterranean coast and is very important to this whole story here as we continue. So, so at the letter of Aristius, then we have uh, Aristobulus, who's a Greek philosopher, second century before Christ. There's a fragment of, of his verification of the story of Aristius in Eusebius's preparation for the gospel. We've got the reference there for that. And Philo, this is very interesting to me. Philo is a Jew from Alexandria, Philo of Alexandria. He lived the same time, his, his life completely overlapped that of Jesus. He lived from 20 BC to 50 AD. And in a work attributed to the Philo, The Life of Moses, he talks about this story of the translation. He considered it to be an inspired translation. And it was interesting to me, he talked about even in his day, which it would have been you know, a couple hundred years after the translation was made, he said there were annual celebrations on the island of Pharos, where the translation was made. So uh, the question is, is this story about this translation, is it a legend or is it fact? And Philo says, no, this is, this is inspired translation. It really happened. And he's on the ground there in Alexandria. He says every year they have a big festival to celebrate this. Now, Pharos, to those who, are, who follow and are interested in ancient history, Pharos, the little island of Pharos, is famous for one other thing. And Pharos is where the famous lighthouse of Alexandria, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, was located. This is where the translation was made on this island off the coast, just, uh, just uh, uh, slightly off the coast of, of Alexandria. And this was one of the tallest structures in the ancient world. It's, it was over 30 stories tall, and it shone a light out over the Mediterranean that could be seen far away. So this is Philo writing, it was from Alexandria, writing about this account. He says, on which account, even to this very day, there is every year a solemn assembly held and a festival celebrated in the island of Pharos, to which not only the Jews, but a great number of persons of, of other nations sail across, reverencing the place in which the first light of interpretation shone forth, and thanking God for that ancient piece of beneficence, which was always young and fresh. So very interesting to me that God chooses this island where the famous lighthouse where the light is shining out over the Mediterranean to bring this translation into the world. Probably just a coincidence, right? Okay, uh, next, Josephus. Josephus is a Jew from Galilee. He lived shortly after the time of Jesus. And he talks about this in two of his works in Antiquities of Jews and Against Appian. He basically confirms the story of um, of the letter of Aristius. Again, he says that this thing really is true, it really happened. And a number of early Christian writers, Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, Clement of Alexandria, Tertullian, all talk about this, that this, this, is a, this, is, this is 
definitely a real, uh, th th this translation is not a fable. It really took place and it was, it was the hand of God. And, the, and this is the, the Old Testament that the church used in the beginning. One of the things I didn't put on the screen here is in the, maybe the earliest of the, one of the earliest Christian writings, in the first century, these are all from the second century, the first century uh, in first Clement, Clement of Rome, this is a letter from the church in Rome to the church in Corinth. And he quotes, he doesn't talk about the Septuagint, I don't think, but he quotes extensively from it. He's got uh, Isaiah 53 and almost all of Psalm 51 in there. And if you look at it, it's obvious that here, here's from one church writer to another church, a church leader to another church leader, in set of church leaders in the first century, and they're quoting he's quoting extensively from the Septuagint. So that's even in the first century. So these these are all these are four quotes from the second century. Uh, here's a depiction of Alexandria, and there's the island of Pharos and where the the lighthouse was located, shown here to give you an idea. Justin Martyr around 160 A.D. Uh, so he's addressed to, and he's addressed to the Greeks. He says, these things, you men of Greece, are no fable. This is the story about the translation of Septuagint. Nor do we narrate fictions, but we ourselves, having been in Alexandria, saw the remains of the little cots at, at, at the pharaohs still preserved. And having heard these things from the inhabitants who had received them as part of their country's tradition, we now tell to you what you also can learn from others especially from those wise and esteemed men who have written of these things like Philo and Josephus and many others. So this doesn't sound like, like a legend to me. Uh, Irenaeus, writing around the year 180 AD and against Heresies Book 3, he says, God has preserved to us the unadulterated scriptures in Egypt. Now think about this, where the house of Jacob flourished, fleeing from the famine of Canaan, where also our Lord was preserved, when he fled from the persecution set on foot by Herod. But the apostles agree this is aforementioned translation, the Septuagint, and the translations and the translation harmonizes with the tradition of the apostles. For Peter, John, Matthew, Paul, and the rest successively, as well as their followers, did set forth all prophetical announcements just as the interpretation of the elders contains them. Now, what's, what's interesting to me about this quote is, Irenaeus, in his youth, learned at the feet of Polycarp, who learned from John and possibly others of the apostles as well. So this is a man who is one human link removed from the apostles themselves. And he makes a connection here, which I think is fascinating. He says, God preserved the unadulterated scriptures in Egypt. And then he points back to this is a pattern in history that God preserved the Jews in Egypt during the famine in Canaan. And then when Jesus was persecuted, he was preserved in, Jesus, in Egypt as well. So that God is using the same pattern here, which I find fascinating, that the light is coming into the world one more time out of Egypt. <clears throat> this is a, for people who doubt that the, uh, <laughs> that the, uh, and we're looking at all the, the, the early evidence. We even have some, some uh, uh, fragments from uh, the Septuagint from 100, dated 150 BC from the book of Deuteronomy here. Um, so the question about this, how much of this origin story is true? Now, uh, there were some, uh, some details tended to grow over time in the retelling of the story. And modern scholars are very skeptical. You pick up a modern book on the Septuagint, and pretty much they'll all say this is a this is a fable, it's a legend, it didn't really happen. However, there is tremendous testimony from the early Christians and the Jews affirming that this story about its origins really did happen. <clears throat> Another question is: the letter of Risius, it says that it was just the five books of Moses that were translated initially. Many people believe that other books were translated over time. The other books were translated over time over that, after that, over the next hundred years or so. And, and uh, others would say that, no, the, the whole thing was translated by the 70 scholars. And the 70 scholars in the letter of Aristius, uh, part of the story was that there were 
from each of the 12 tribes, six men were selected. So six times 12 is 72. And the round, round, that, to, round that to 70, that's where you get the Septuagint, this means of, of the, the translation of the 70, uh, based on the Latin. And LXX is the Latin numerals for 70. That's where that comes from. So how do we, how do we resolve this question? We've got the Masoretic text. We've got the Septuagint. Which one do we follow here? And uh, so I'm thinking, let, let's start with some basic principles. Jesus said, one is your teacher, the Christ, and you're all brethren in Matthew 23. And in Luke 6, he says, a disciple is not above his teacher. Everyone is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. So the question I would have is, Jesus is the teacher. He's the ultimate teacher. What what Bible, what text did he use? What text did he read? What text did he quote from? And then his students, his disciples, the apostles, what did they read and quote from? That uh, I, I, It's hard for me to know what the right answer is. I'm just going to trust whatever they use and we'll go with that. So <clears throat> uh, some basic questions. Did Jesus read Greek? Another thing is, did Jesus read Hebrew? That it did, it, what language was Jesus able to read it? We know from Luke chapter 4 that he was able to read, definitely, and uh, that he was, uh, uh, from other things that he said as well. And we know for one thing, we know he spoke Aramaic from uh, Eloi, Eloi, Lama Sabachthani, which is when he was on the cross, Mark 15. And he takes the child by the hand, says Talitha Kumi, and there are other places as well. He calls Peter Cephas, which I believe is an Aramaic word. So in all four Gospels, there's, there, there's the, the Gospels are written in Greek, but they will transliterate some words in Aramaic, which indicates that Jesus definitely spoke Aramaic. We know that. So the, the question is, what, what scriptures did Jesus read? Was he reading the Greek scriptures that were in circulation at that time? Was he reading the Hebrew scriptures that were, that were available then? What did he read and what did his disciples read? Was it Hebrew or was it in Greek? Uh, now, scholars will disagree about the extent of the the, uh, the 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 knowledge of Hebrew in the early world in in Palestine and in, in Israel, and uh, I, I found this fascinating. This is, a, this is the Theodosius inscription in Jerusalem for the first century A.D. Of course, this would be before the fall of Jerusalem in A.D. seventy, so this would be pretty close to the time of Christ, if not the same time. And this is this is an inscription in Jerusalem, all in Greek. And think about this. It says Theodosius, son of Betanus, priest and head of the synagogue, son of a head of a synagogue, and grandson of the head of a synagogue, built this synagogue for the reading of the law and teaching the commandments, as well as the guest room, the chambers, the water fittings, as an inn for those in need from abroad. The synagogue which his fathers founded with the elders and the Simonides. So this is an inscription is all in Greek, which tells me you don't put an inscription like this up if nobody reads Greek so, in Jerusalem. So, so uh, uh, <clears throat> obviously, uh, a lot of people could, could read Greek. This is, I found this kind of interesting. This is, the, the, this is an estimate of the, the extent of Greek and Latin in the ancient world. Uh, so one writer said that there were at least... 60 different languages spoken in the Roman Empire. But in the Eastern Roman Empire, pretty much everybody knew Greek as a second language. And in the Western part, it was more Latin. Although even, even in Rome, which is in the Western part, there were an awful lot of, of Greek speakers, as uh, you, can see from, you can see from reading Justin Martyr's first apology. So and think about Paul's missionary journey, where he went, okay? Think about it in Asia Minor, the seven churches of Asia, in Macedonia, Berea, Athens, Corinth. These are all Greek-speaking areas. So what was he reading? Uh, from Luke chapter 4, in uh, verses 16 to 20, Jesus goes into the synagogue in Nazareth, um, in the in, uh, in, in, uh, Capernaum. And let's, let's read from Luke chapter 4. See what we can learn here. Verse 16. 
So he came to Nazareth where he'd been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he opened the book, he found the place where it is written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. Now, I wish I was there. I would have, I would have, I would have snuck up behind him and said, Can I, you mind if I take a peek a little bit? At least I want to see what language is in. Um, so here he's, Jesus is reading, and he's reading from, he, he enrolls the scroll, he knows, he knows uh, where to go, and he's reading from Isaiah chapter 61, the two first, first verses, and this statement in here that jumps out at me, and it says, he said, sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. That's not in the Masoretic text, that's in the Septuagint. And what's this is recovery of sight to the blind, actually healing blind, healing the blind is a, is a significant miracle of Jesus in Luke chapter seven, where the disciples of John the Baptist are sent to Jesus to find out, are you the one we've been waiting for, or is there somebody else yet to come? He responds and he says, well, you can, he doesn't answer yes or no. He says, go tell John that the blind are receiving their sight. And the gospel, the good news is being proclaimed to the poor, and all these sick people are being healed. And I think that's it's basically he's 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 saying that he's fulfilling the prophecies of Isaiah 61 and and I, Isaiah uh, um, 53 in in the Septuagint. Basically, that's what he's saying by communicating that. Okay, another one, Mark chapter seven. <clears throat> In Mark chapter 7, the Pharisees and scribes uh, come to him from Jerusalem, and they notice that he and his disciple, his disciples are eating with, without ceremonially washing their hands. And <clears throat> verse 5, the Pharisees and scribes asked him, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? He answered and said to them, well, did Isaiah prophesy about you hypocrites? As it is written, these people honor me, me these, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandments of God, you hold the traditions of men, the washing of pitchers and cups, and many other things. And then he, he rebukes them for re rejecting the command of God. And he says, uh, verse 12, you no longer let him do anything for his father or mother, making the word of God of no effect through your traditions, which you hand down. So Jesus is describing what they're, do, what they're doing. And he says, you're worshiping me in vain. Through your following your traditions, you're invalidating the word of God and making the word of God of no effect. The whole point that he's saying is tied in to the statement by Isaiah, in vain they worship me. That statement, in vain they worship me, is in the Septuagint, but it's not in the Masoretic text, and it's integral to the whole point that he's making to the Pharisees. So what does that tell you about what he's reading? What does it tell you about what they're reading, that he would use that, that passage? Matthew chapter 21. Here's another, what I think is a very clear example. <clears throat> In Matthew 21, <clears throat> starting in verse 14, and the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant and said to him, Do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes. Have you never read out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants you have perfected praise? Then he left them and went out of the city to Bethany, and he lodged there. 
This is a quote directly in the Greek from Psalm 8, verse 3 in the Septuagint. In the Masoretic text, it doesn't say anything about perfecting praise. It says you have ordained strength. The whole point of what Jesus is saying here is based on the wording of the Septuagint. Out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have perfected praise. They're praising, saying Hosanna to the son of David. So this is the whole point of what he's saying. It's not just a slight difference in wording, but, but the whole the substance is not backed up by the Masoretic text of what he's making. Uh, this is an, another one I like, Revelation chapter 2. <clears throat> I found interesting. So Revelation 2, of course, he's addressing the seven churches in Asia. And this is to the church in Thyatira. In verse... Twenty-five. He says, hold fast what you have till I come. And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessel, as I have also have received from my father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. So this is a quote from Psalm 2. In verse nine, and it says, in, "In the it says he shall rule them with a rod of iron." Greek word is the Greek word for shepherd is poimen, and the and the that's a noun, and then the verb form is poimeno, which is means to shepherd, or figuratively means to rule. And this is word is a common word used throughout the New Testament, the Old Testament. Uh, Peter and Paul use that when they're addressing elders, telling them they need to shepherd the flock, that they, they need to, to rule over them as, as, a, as a shepherd would over a flock. So he says, you shall rule them with a rod of iron, they shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessel. The two statements in Psalm 2 and verse 9. Uh, in the Masoretic text, it doesn't say he will shepherd them, rule them with a rod of iron. It says you shall break them with a rod of iron. Very different picture. So the whole point of what he's making is that you will rule the nations. He's applying this prophecy in Psalm 2 that's, that applies to him. He's applying it to us. He said, if you overcome, you will rule the nations also, like, like, like I have. This, this reference to Psalm 2, verse 9, following the wording of the, uh, the Septuagint, not the Masoretic text, is repeated in Revelation 12, 5 and 19, 15 regarding Jesus himself. So this is another example where the two texts differ and what Jesus, the whole point that Jesus is making is based on this that Septuagint. Uh, question for you here. Uh, think of the prophecy in Isaiah that says he was led like a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before the shearers is silent. Or wait a minute, does it say he was led like a sheep to the slaughter and like as a lamb before the shearer is the sun, which one is it? And if you're confused about that, there's probably a good reason because in the Bibles that are based on the Masoretic text Old Testament, it says he was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before the shearer is the silent. But if you're reading in Acts chapter two with the Ethiopian eunuch is quoting it, it's reversed. I hope I got that right. I didn't get it backwards. Let's, let's read in Acts chapter eight. So what's the Ethiopian eunuch reading? <clears throat> this is a famous story of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. <clears throat> so uh, Philip hears the Ethiopian eunuch riding along in his chariot, reading from Isaiah the prophet. Uh, verse 29, then the spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you're reading? He said, how can I, unless someone guides me? Ask Philip to come up and sit with him. The place in the scripture where he read was this. 
He was led as a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. And his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does this prophet say this of himself or some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture, preached Jesus to him. And then they go down the road and, and the eunuch asked to be baptized. So um, now <clears throat> it's interesting here because Isaiah 53, this part of Isaiah 53 is quite a bit different in the Septuagint than it is in the Masoretic text. And the, 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 what the Ethiopian eunuch is reading is following the Septuagint as a it's the lamb that's being sheared and the the sheep that's being slaughtered. First of all, it's it's reversed in the Masoretic text, and then the last statement: his in his humiliation, his justice was taken away. Who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. The Masoretic text is totally different for that part altogether. So Philip, when he comes up to him, doesn't say to the Ethiopian eunuch, "Excuse me." Where did you get that translation of the scriptures? Was it the bent and defective booth of, of scripture sales in, in Jerusalem when you were there? So he, he, Philip, Philip doesn't rebuke him for reading a corrupted text he's re because he's not. He's reading from the Septuagint. Acts 15. Think about this. Acts 15, the dispute in the church. <laughs> and so... Paul, Peter, James, the apostles, the elders are all gathered together to answer the question, what do we do with the Gentiles who are coming to the faith? And Peter and Paul give their, uh, give their testimony of what happened, but the matter is only resolved when James speaks up and speaks last, and he he closes down the issue by giving a quote is actually a prophecy from Amos. So, and uh, let's read in Acts chapter 15, starting in verse 13. And after they have become silent, James answers saying, men and brethren, listen to me. Simon has declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles to take out of them the people for his name. And with this words of the prophet, with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as is written, after this I will return, I will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, I will rebuild its ruins, so, and I will set it up, so the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who were called by my name, says the Lord who does all these things. Known to God from eternity are all his works. Therefore, I judge we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who were turning to God. And he goes on from there, says that they don't need to follow Moses, just mentions four things specifically. So he's quoting from Amos chapter 9, verse 11 to 12. This is a, a, a very controversial matter in the early church. And he, he shuts it down by quoting Amos chapter 9, verses 11 and 12 from the Septuagint. So this is their own. This is gathered together with all the apostles. And nobody speaks up and says, wait a minute, that's not what my Bible says. Okay. <clears throat> the, the whole part about the Gentiles seeking the Lord, the main point that he's making is not even in the Masoretic text, it's in the Septuagint. And then actually, this is a this is a, a hidden prophecy here that James is 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 pointing out here in the course of he's focusing on the second part. The first part, I think, is a prophecy about the resurrection. After the, the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, is rebuilt, I think that's a, a figurative way of speaking about the body of Christ being resurrected. Then after that, all the Gentiles who are called by my name will seek me. So this is, okay, the, the, the tabernacle has been raised up, and now the Gentiles will seek the Lord. And, and that ends the discussion right there. So what does that tell you about the view of the apostles toward the inspiration of the Septuagint? Uh, Hebrews 10, I had a little fun with this one uh, a few years back. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 35 to 39. I think it was, I, was, I was in a group of teachers. 
And, uh, you know, I think I was the only one in the room who had been reading the Septuagint text of the Old Testament. And, <clears throat> but they didn't know that. So as I was reading, this is an introduction to Hebrews chapter 11. It was a group of teachers. And I, I read from Hebrews chapter 10, the introduction to the, the Hall of Heroes in ha chapter 11, and I asked two questions. Um, so let's read Hebrews 10, starting in verse 35. Hebrews writer says, Therefore do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward, for you have, great, you have need of endurance. So after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. For yet a little while, he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. And I asked the question, this is a group of old teachers, and I said, where does it say in the Old Testament, the just or the righteous will live by faith? And everybody looks at the footnotes in their Bible and says, oh, that's Habakkuk chapter 2, uh, you know, verses, verses uh, 3 and 4. And I say, great, okay, now where does it say, if he shrinks back, my soul will not be pleased with him? And I got, it was crickets, I got a blank stare in the room. And, and I said, uh, before going on, I said, and now, at the end of this, at the end of this class here, I, I'd be interested if you can point it out. Show me in your Bible where it says this, and if you can't show me in your Bible, I'll show you in my Bible. So one of the guys in the class um, had completely threw him off. I thought this guy has challenged my knowledge of the Word of God. So he, the rest of the class, he's just flipping through his Bible, trying to find a where in the world does it say, "If he shrinks back, my soul will not be pleased with it." He comes up frustrated at the end of the class. And he's thinking about this. He says, wait a minute. He said, I'll show you in my Bible. And he, he, he knew by reputation that I was a little bit of a, of a wise guy, practical joker. He says, let me see that Bible you've got there. He wrenched it out of my hands and he said, what is this? What is this? Is, this is, what is this Bible here? And I said, well, actually, where it says the righteous shall live by faith is, is Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. And where it says, and if he shrinks back, my soul will not be pleased with him, is back to chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, in the Septuagint. And that's the whole point. After quoting that, that's the point the Hebrew writer makes. We are not of those who draw back to perdition. So that's the intro to Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, so you miss some things if you're not following along in the Septuagint here. The Hebrew writer assumes that you know this. <clears throat> Uh, then Acts chapter 28, so uh, I don't want to neglect Paul here. So <clears throat> Paul was in Rome. In Acts chapter 28, and the Jews listen to him. Most of them reject what he's saying. He quotes from uh, Isaiah chapter 6, 9 to 10, as Jesus did in Matthew 13. And, and it says in his quote in in Acts chapter 28, the heart of this people have grown dull, their ears are hard of hearing, their eyes have, they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn so I should heal them. Now, Masoretic texts and Septuagint are almost the same, okay? The difference is that in, if you're reading in the Masoretic text, it's like something has happened to the people in the Septuagint, it says their eyes, they have closed. So who's responsible for closing their eyes? It's the people. They've closed their eyes. It's not that God has closed their, their eyes. They've closed their eyes. So that's the whole point that Paul is making is when he's quoting that. He's quoting his quote is following the Septuagint, that they are responsible for closing their eyes. It's their fault. Um, <clears throat> now, there are... Um, I think if, if you're not reading a, an Old Testament based on the Septuagint, you may be missing a few things. I'll give you one example, which I found was fascinating. Psalm 145 is in the form of an acrostic poem, just like Psalm uh, 119 is, which means that every successive letter, every successive line in Psalm is by a successive letter of the alphabet. So it runs through the entire Hebrew alphabet except that in the Masoretic text, there's one letter missing. The letter, the, the, the Hebrew letter 
Nun, sorry, in, 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 in the Masoretic text, the, the Hebrew letter Nun, after Psalm 145, verse 23, is missing in the Masoretic text. It's present there. The equivalent of that is present in Septuagint, and actually in the Dead Sea Scrolls, they found that the Dead Sea Scrolls go back about a thousand years earlier than the Masoretic text, but there's just, you know, it's not, it's not a full text, it's just, just some fragments of it uh, and some, some individual books. But uh, the line, the Lord is faithful in all his words and all his holy works is in the Septuagint and in the Hebrew and was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And that is the missing line that's in there so people who say the Masoretic text is, per is perfect and isn't missing anything it's pretty obvious what happened there is that something got dropped by for whatever reason and just never was picked up again another example of missing verses if you read Romans chapter 3 verses 10 to 18 this is a famous statement by Paul talking about the corruption of mankind that, that no one no one is good, no, not one, and so forth. And if you look in, in most of the Bible's footnotes, it will, it will indicate that there's this whole collage of quotes from the Old Testament that Paul is using, but he's not. You go back to the Septuagint, which he's reading and quoting from, and the whole thing is in, Psalm, is in one Psalm, it's Psalm 14, and uh, there are some missing lines in verse 3, so Paul just fills in it. So you compare the Masoretic text with Septuagint, and it's, it's obvious what Paul's quoting from. He's, and he's including the lines from the Septuagint that are not Masoretic text there. Uh, not only are there quotes that are backed up by the Septuagint over the Masoretic text, and I don't want to leave a mis 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 misimpression here, there are some quotes in the New Testament that follow the, the Masoretic text instead of the Septuagint. There are just a lot more that are the other way, and I've given some examples of those. Uh, and there are lots of people who have, have gone through and cataloged, whether it's two-thirds, one-third, me ten, whatever it is. There's some, some manner of judgment, but it's, it's a lot more than are definitely following the Septuagint. So, but there are, also, there are also details and stories that if you haven't read the Septuagint version of the Old Testament, you really might miss what's going on there. Uh, one example is in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 21. It says, by faith, Jacob dying, each of the sons of Joseph did bless and did bow upon the top of his staff. So I'm, I'm, this is quoting from the, uh, the uh, Young's Little Translation, uh, because I think the, the, uh, it, it's a little, a little, more, uh, little more literal. On, on this particular one is the idea. It says, I think in, the, in a lot of translations say leaning on the top of the staff. It's, it actually it's, it's more he's 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 prostrating himself. He's bowing down on the top of the staff here. And uh, in the Masoretic text, that's from that's that's following the Septuagint. You can go back if you can have an interlinear. You see, it's exactly what it says in the Septuagint from uh, Genesis 47. In the Masoretic text, he says he's he's leaning on the top of his bed. So it's, it's, it's quite different there. Uh, and then one in, another one in Hebrews chapter 11 is actually a uh, uh, significant passage. By faith, Enoch was taken away so he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. Before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. All right, where is the testimony that Enoch had that he pleased God? I'll tell you where it is. It's in Genesis 5, verses 22 to 24 in the Septuagint, where it says Enoch pleased God. In the Masoretic text, it said Enoch walked with God. The Septuagint, it says he pleased God. And the Hebrew writer says Enoch was taken away because he had the testimony that he pleased God. So what is he referring to? It's pretty obvious. Some other advantages of using the Septuagint. The, the, the Septuagint is in the same language, Greek, as the, as the New Testament. There's only a few hundred years separating the two. If you can read one, you can read the other. Uh, the, uh, the Septuagint was the Bible of the early church. So if you want to understand when the early Christians are writing about a passage of scripture, you're reading the same thing that they are. And you can also understand what critical words would have meant to the apostles and the early Christians who are reading critical words in the New Testament, which appear many, many times in the Old Testament. So when they're hearing this word, this is not a new word. It's a concept that was rooted in the scriptures they had. 
For example, righteousness. I've seen so many people misdefine righteousness. And if you look at what how Peter defines it in 1 Peter, he goes back to Psalm 34 from the Septuagint. Grace is a word that appears in, in the Old Testament many places, which is misdefined. Love agape. Okay, that's, that's another one that, that is, is clearly mystified. Uh, what holiness, Christ mean, meaning the anointed one, even the name of Jesus showing up in the Old Testament, in the, the, uh, if, if you're reading it, Septuagint, the one who would be succeeding Moses, Hosea, the son of Nun, was given the name Jesus in Greek. And Moses was concerned that the people wouldn't be like sheep without a shepherd, so he lays his hands on Jesus there, literally in the Greek. And, and resurrection, the prophecy is about the resurrection. If you look at the New Testament, and then go back and look at the Septuagint, that will you pick up some new, some good insights into prophecies about the resurrection. So, big question: Should we consider the Septuagint for our Old Testament? And you're going to have to answer that question. I think you know. You know what I would say about that, but uh, uh, that, that's where we're left. And I would say, you know, it's not a question of the Masoretic text is bad and the, and, and the Septuagint is good. The, the Masoretic text is great, and, and the Septuagint will give you, help you to see some things, I think, even more clearly. And so it will provide many, many benefits. And I just want to encourage everyone to explore this, to, to just check it out, to, to, uh, to, if you're not familiar with it, just take a look, and hopefully this, is, this has been a little bit of encouragement in that direction. Resources for those who want to go further. Uh, David Berceau did an excellent summary. I'd say the next step would be uh, discovering the Septuagint is an audio book, an audio form or ebook that's available from School Publishing. That's very good. Of all the things I've looked at, that's, that's one of the very best and clearest. Uh, and then... Just go for it. Get a good English translation of Septuagint. I use the Orthodox Study Bible, the OSB, but uh, Brenton's is available uh, uh, freely online. And then there's the Lexham English Septuagint, the New English Translation of Septuagint, the Nets, and some others. Uh, I don't know which one is best, but uh, you can you can just start start reading and see what you find. The uh, Apostolic Bible Polyglot is interesting to me. It's an interesting resource for those who want to take it a step further, because you have an interlinear Septuagint and New Testament together with a, with a common concordance, a common Greek concordance. So you can see where words show up in, in, in the New Testament, where they also show up in the Septuagint to get a clear understanding of what they mean. And of course, if you want to dive into the deep end of the pool, and I'm sure Finney's going to talk about that in, in his class, you can get a copy of the uh, Rolf's Anhart Septuaginta, the Greek text, and uh, read that as well. There are many other resources available online or through Christian bookstores if you want to explore this subject. And at that point, I will open things up for questions, discussion, and feedback. Thank you. Uh, I have three questions. Number one, when will this be yes. posted? Number two, do you have notes? Number three, if you have notes, can you share them? Okay, I almost always write notes, but um, in this case, I put most of the stuff on here, so it's all kind of rattling around in my head. So I tried to uh, I tried to provide the technical material and the backup on the slides. So I think almost everything I said you should be able to find somewhere on the slides themselves. So that that's and as far as when it's going to get posted, uh, I'll defer to to. Uh, the technical support staff on that. Yeah, Dan, uh, this will be posted um, within the next uh, three or four days. <laughs> and Roger, Chuck, thank you much. Chuck, if you want to uh, stop your screen share, then we can see your face better. There, that's, uh, that's perfect. Great. Hey, thanks for that, Brother Chuck. Um, very insightful. A uh, question. For the Masoretic text, you said that it is as late as 1000 AD. Okay. Um, yes. What? That, that's the, the, the manuscript. Yes. Right. And what would that have been rooted in originally? Do you know? 
Like, do they have any record of where that came from? Um, yeah, but there, there's there's an the account that the Jews, the, the, these are the, the Masoretes who over a period of a few hundred years, I believe, were, were pulling together based on the manuscripts that they had, what they considered to be a, you know, they had to obviously choose between the different manuscripts that they had to try to piece together what was the most accurate presentation. And then the other thing that they did was the... <clears throat> The, the older versions of the Jewish scriptures, it's all consonants with no vowels and no points telling you how you're supposed to pronounce or accent the words. So the, the, the Masoretes added that to the scriptures that they had. So they, they took the scriptures that they had, uh, tried to come up with the, the best ones from ancient times, and then they applied the the, the pointings to the text as well, which had not, my understanding had not been there before. So that's, a, which is useful, but that's, that's, so that's, that's my understanding is that it was based on the earlier text that they had, which we don't have. Okay, thank you. Is it correct to say then that those Masoretes being Jews were partial against this uh, Septuagint because of the obvious more direct references to Christ? than what uh, they like yeah that that that, that charge has been made <laughs> in ancient times and modern times uh that uh that there are some things that were left out that the the christians were really exploiting the septuagint to spread the faith and challenging the jews and and Justin Martyr talks about that in his dialogue with Trifo, who's a Jew, about, and there are accusations among the early Christians about the Jews changing the text. And uh, uh, so that, that charge has been there from ancient times, and, and I've seen that some people repeat that today, so that there was a, you know, and, and the, whole, the whole idea that some Christians have is that, all right, Romans 11 God describes the Jews as the branches that have been broken off of the tree, the olive tree. And, and okay, so, all right, now we're going to be looking to the branches that are broken off to give us the scriptures, okay, after they've been broken off. It's like, it's like wait a minute, there's something wrong with this picture here. We're not going to trust the church, the tree. We're going to trust the branches that have been broken off a thousand years later to give us uh, what what's what's the word of God? So, um, you know, there's there's a there's a, there's a good 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 subject to ponder there. But yeah, I've I've seen the charge that uh, that the the Jews from ancient times the charge among the Christians that the Jews had tampered with the scriptures. So, if that has been an ancient charge, why have uh, has the Christian Church allowed? Uh, what should I say, an inclination to Masoretic, why have they not been more insistent upon the Septuagint for the last thousand years? Well, that's a good question. I think the people in the East, are, the Eastern Christians are, are asking that question. Well, why did you guys depart from, from the, historic, the historic faith that we all shared at the beginning in terms of the, the best Old Testament text? So this is a uh, this, this is, this is a very good question. Why did they do that? And, you know, well, I think David Rousseau goes into this in his in his uh, 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 work on the Septuagint that I referenced in the notes there, in explaining some of the history behind that. Jerome is a was the Bible translator around the year 400, who took the Western Church on a different path of of using the Vulgate, which was translated to a large extent from ancient Hebrew texts. Uh, and, you know, there's some based on some questionable things that Jerome said, which <laughs> about about comparing the two, the Masoretic text and, and the, the Septuagint, um, uh, which, uh, uh, yeah, so that, that's, that's, a, uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a really good question. Why did that happen? And I think a lot of people are people are is, uh, see a lot of interest in that today. Let's let's take another look at this. Is it also true that we can credit Erasmus for helping correct this problem? I don't know. 
I don't know. That, that's a, that's a part of a part of church history that I'm a little uh, cloudy on. So I don't know. I don't know what his role in in that. He's talking about the Texas Receptus. Is that uh, what's the? No, what's I'm talking about whenever he made his critical revision of the Greek text. That was the first time that anybody separated their study from Jerome. He decided that he's <laughs> going to go back to the original, and he went back to the Greek text that he had available. Yeah. And uh, he created this brand new critical Greek revision and from my set from my understanding we credit him for that because everybody was bound to drum up until that time yeah i okay i don't know if the 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 great text that erasmus was working was that just new testament uh yeah. so that I mean, was mostly new testament i'm not i'm just not sure yeah yeah Hi, Scott. good questions um, uh, I'm wondering if you know anything about the textual his, uh, the text critical issues of the Septuagint. I've noticed that um, there's significant variation between the ABP and the Brenton Septuagint. Uh, I, I've heard it, there's quite a lot of te textual variation in the Septuagint that we have today. So I'm just wondering if you know about that. Yeah, have, the, the uh, I mean, I've got... Okay, this is what I use. This is the the Rolf's uh, Septuagint, where they have the the notes of any of the variations in the Septuagint. They have that footnoted in all the major the, the major texts. So there are there are variations in the text. Um, the uh, I was uh, I was reading. I was in some of the reading I was doing. Was some, somebody mentioned that uh, in First Clement there was extensive quotations from the Septuagint. So I was taking a look at that. I happen to have a, a copy of that here in uh, Greek and English. And you know, this is this is something Rome to the church in Corinth. It's written in Greek, and there are quotations all over it from the Septuagint and including all of Isaiah 53 and almost all of Psalm 51 and some very long quotes. And I was, I was very pleasantly surprised when I was comparing the what's in the, the critical, the critical text that I just showed you versus what was being quoted from one group of church one from one church to another church uh greek speakers in the uh, in the first century so it it really encouraged me that uh the the, the text seems to be pretty stable from the first century to the uh, you know the, the the fourth century uh, that it was it was basically identical so and i encourage you to check that check these things out for yourself if you if you have an interest in that, just to see, okay, when the early Christians are quoting from the Septuagint, particularly these longer quotes, how well do they line up with the text that we currently have? <laughs> okay, and that Ralph um, text is that would that be the same thing that the Brenton Septuagint and Orthodox Study Bible is based on, or do you not know that? No, no, they're not actually. Uh, they're not. They the um, Brenton's and the Orthodox say they're based on specific texts of the Septuagint. Rolf's is, um, it has the main text, but it also lists all the variants in the, in the footing. So then, and then there have been places where, if I'm reading the Orthodox study Bible or Brenton's, it doesn't, something doesn't line up between the Old Testament and the New Testament. But I'm, when I'm looking at the variants in the in uh, Rolf's that actually at least one of them does line up. So, uh, you know, they're, they're, that's why I like to, uh, in, in pursuing this a little further, not just rely on one particular translation, which is generally based on one manuscript of the Septuagint. That's a very good question.
Somebody had asked me a question in the chat yes. earlier about <laughs> why uh, we don't go back to the original uh, Hebrew. Um, and uh, do, do you want to contribute to that? Why would we? Yeah. So if the so somebody had asked um, in the in the chat if if there's a reason why we would translate from the Greek, which is itself a translation from the Hebrew. Uh, if the Hebrew predates the Greek, uh, why would we uh, go from the Septuagint? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I and I, I I I ran into one critic who said it's like you know why would you read Shakespeare? in Polish, a Polish translation of Shakespeare, wouldn't you want to go back to the original language? And so the, the question that I have, I'll, I'll go back to Jesus and say, what was he reading? What were the apostles reading? What did they assume that their opponents were reading? What were all the, when the, all the apostles are gathered together in a room in the council of Jerusalem, what are they reading? Okay. And that's my answer. That's what I want to read. Whatever, whatever they're reading, that's what I want to read. So, you know, the early, some of the early Christians considered the Septuagint to be an inspired translation. Now, whether that's true or not, I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of questions, things I don't know. But if I want to follow the text that's closest to what Jesus and the apostles are quoting, then then that's where that's where I land. And is it is it correct that the pre-Masoretic Hebrew does not exist anywhere? We don't really have the option to go back to the original <laughs> Hebrew. All we can go back to is the Masoretic. Well, yeah, the Dead Sea Scrolls are, um, you know, they're a thousand years or so earlier than Masoretic texts, but you don't, they're just fragments. And you have, you have the, uh, uh, I think you've got quite a bit of Isaiah, maybe the whole thing, but, but you don't have the whole Old Testament there. And then the other thing is in the, the Dead Sea Scrolls, um, it, it, it suggests that there were actually multiple manuscript traditions that were out there. There's some of the Dead Sea Scrolls that line up closely with Masoretic texts, some line up more with the Septuagint, and then some would line up more with the Samaritan uh, Pentateuch. So there were multiple traditions that were circulating side by side even before the time of Christ. Um, so anyway, that's that's the yeah yeah thank you. I heard someone talking about this one time and they said that the primary copies of the Septuagint have been corrupted or were corrupted. Do you have any idea what he was talking about? Uh, no, and, and and I would say if someone wants to say that, say, okay, when were they corrupted? And um, what's the evidence for that? When were they corrupted? I mean, we have various versions of the Septuagint that are out there as indicated by the the notes in the critical text that I just mentioned that you have you have some variation between the different uh the, between the different texts but that's why I was encouraged by going back to a, a very early Christian quote extensive Christian quotations from the Septuagint uh from from uh, Clement of Rome in the first century to to to, to see what what were they quoting back and forth to each other? What were they reading? Chuck, um, this is David. There, you mentioned some texts that were um, not included in the Masoretic. I, I think of in the Septuagint how much I've been blessed by the prayer of King Manasseh, sections in Esther. I was wondering if you had favorite passages that you know, aren't in the Masoretic, but are in the Septuagint. Well, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't want to tread on David Brousseau's ground. He, he's, he is uh, going to be teaching a class on the Deuterocanonical books, but I've certainly been blessed by Wisdom of Sirach. I was raised, I was raised Catholic, and that was in my Catholic Bible, but I didn't, really wasn't reading the Bible much back in those days, so uh but that was a blessing to me. Also very interesting to me, if you're reading Job, 
that there are some, some additional things in the, in the Septuagint version of Job that really help put the pieces together in terms of understanding the relationship between historically when Job lived and also his relationship with uh, the, the line of Abraham too. So, uh, but there, there's, all kind, there's all kinds of treasures that are hidden in there. And I just encourage people to, uh, to, 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 to dig in and, and, and learn and grow and, and be challenged by that. But it's a great question. One of the special gems is in uh, the Wisdom of Solomon, chapter two, there's actually a prophecy of Christ, uh, a prediction of Christ that I think everybody should read. <laughs> yeah. Amen. There, there, are some, there are some great prophecies uh, that are in there. Wisdom of Solomon definitely uh, comes to mind. There's some, some great, great uh, encouraging things. And uh, that's, that's an excellent point. Hey, hey, Chuck, thank you. Um, enjoyed your presentation here again. Um, so I have a question for you. I, I, was, I was reading a critique of the Septuagint recently. I think it was on a King James Version only uh, website. And their argument was that, so the reason the Septuagint, the reason the New Testament quotes line up with the Septuagint is because by the time the New, T New Testament was written down, went from oral to, to written down, they had switched, the church had switched to using the Septuagint. And so therefore they just made the quotes all line up with the Septuagint. Do you have any comments on that? Well, okay, Let, let's, let's, let's think about that one. Let's go back to the council in Jerusalem in Acts 15. All right, <laughs> all the apostles are gathered together. That's the whole point of what they're saying is what's in the Septuagint, not in the Masoretic text. Else the nations will seek him. That's the whole point. I mean, fraudulent when he says that this is what they talked about and this is what they said, or, or you know, it's me, to me, it's, it's, it, or, or the Ethiopian eunuch. Okay. Did, did Luke, is Luke faking this in here? This isn't really the case. Uh, you know, <laughs> this is, you're, 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 there, there has to be some fraud in the creation of the scriptures because they're quoting this stuff all, all over the place. They just say, say so you're telling me the New Testament has been corrupted? <laughs> yeah, thanks. No, I, I agree. I'm, I, I have an uh, Orthodox study Bible I've been reading for the last couple of years. I need to I need to get into it some more, but I, uh, yeah, I like it. Thanks a lot. This has been fascinating. Um, good, good discussion here. And there was a comment come in on the uh, chat. For those of us who do not know Greek, what is a good dependable version of the Bible to read? Um. <clears throat> In terms of New Testament, Old Testament, I guess that's the, the, the uh, I personally like the New King James for the New Testament, um, but, you know, and I, that's just my personal preference. Um, and any, any, you know, any good literal, any good accurate translation that's based on Septuagint, I would prefer for, for the Old Testament. I'm just, I happen to use the Orthodox Study Bible, but I'm not sure if that's the best, but that's, that's, I think that's decent. Um, but uh, no, I, I like the, uh, I personally like the New King James. I, I mean, I have my own reasons why I, why I prefer that, but uh, I, I totally respect people who use ESV or prefer the King James or ESV or other uh, New American Standard, there, there are a lot of good translations out there. All right, thank you. I think we will um, wrap this up. I'm sure this conversation could be ongoing. Um, it has been ongoing in a lot of debates all over the place, and it should keep going, I think. So thank you for speaking into this topic in a knowledgeable way. Uh, giving us some insight into the Bible that we have and the Bible that we should read. So God bless you for your study and um, for sharing with us here this morning on this. Um, it has been great. I've been studying some of this at Sattler. And so this talk this morning was especially interesting. 
uh, based on some of the textual criticisms and things that we're, we've been studying there. So um, there's a lot more, there's a lot to it. And one thing we can know that the word of God has been preserved and that we have the truth um, as God would have us have it. And so we can look into these things. And I think we should be concerned with the accuracy of the books of the book that we read and um, so thank you for this insight. It's very helpful. I think, uh, would you say a prayer and then I'll make some comments after the prayer and close us? Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, thank you for giving us your word that's a light shining in a dark place, that uh, we can understand the deep mysteries from all time that have been hidden and have been revealed through your son, Jesus. Father, increase our faith, increase our love and devotion to your word, that we can understand how to live the Christian life, how we can understand how to, how to live lives that please you, that we can understand uh, your personality, we can understand your will, and that we can effectively uh, minister to others around us who are believers and who don't yet believe. Uh, I pray that you will help us to be diligent, not to give way to laziness and worldliness, but to be diligent in, in our your word. And I uh, pray that you bless every person who's participated in this and that, uh, that, that this be a blessing to your church. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, those of you who are still on, thank you for hanging around for an extra 25 minutes of discussion. I think it was profitable. Um, an announcement, in a couple weeks, we're going to have a two-part series by Arthur Nisley from Kansas, and that'll be on sexual addiction. So come here again on um, November the 19th. We'll have a meeting at six o'clock again, and then the second part, I believe, will be at three o'clock in the afternoon. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. So come um, for that as well. Thank you for coming on here this morning, and um, God bless you all for um, considering these important uh, subjects about the scriptures that we have. So go with God. Amen. Thank you. As iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend.